Good afternoon, guys. We would like to say hello to all of you and thank you for your time. Actually, thank you for taking your time and coming here. My name is Ingrida Grigaitide and I am a member of Center for PINs as well as a PhD candidate here at Ob Academy. Mm. I'm Ishi Kulubash. I am also a member of Center for PINs and I'm a PhD student here in developmental psychology and we are very honored to have you here. Mm -hmm. That's really true. We have been preparing for this for quite a while. Uh, I think the idea of organizing a seminar on discrimination already started in the end of 2018 when we started to jot ideas. What can we as a center for PINs do for the society here in Ostrobotnia region? And uh, once we started to talk with different people, the topic of discrimination came up quite often. And therefore, in spring 2019, we organized three workshops on societal and institutional discrimination to find out what's really happening here within the area. And so today we are very happy to have Sarah with us, who is like running back and forward here, probably getting excited, who is going to present the results of the three workshops a little bit later today. I guess all of you already have a program with you, so you can follow the happenings during the upcoming three hours. And uh, we have our guest lecturer, who is sitting there in the middle. Uh, his name is uh, Emmanuel Akua. He's an assistant professor within a minority studies at the Faculty of Education and Welfare Studies here at Obo Academy University. So we are very happy to have him with us because we have been hearing so much from the fellow students and the faculty members, so much good about him. So it's really an honor to have you here. And his research areas are quite broad, but however, it focuses on multiculturalism, diversity and inclusion. So right on the top on the things that we have to tell here today during the, during the seminar. So without any delay, we would like to invite Emmanuel Aqua. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Inviting me. I'm going to very officially shake your hand yes. once again. <laughs> I don't mind a hug. And a hug again. That's always nice welcome. with some hugs. Part of the inclusion. Excellent. So good luck with that. Thank we're you gonna very much. We're going to start with the presentation. And after that, we're going to have a question and answer session. So guys, don't be shy. Don't be afraid. And, uh, and I hope you're going to have some questions for, uh, for Emmanuel. Yeah. Is it too loud? It's perfect. Okay, um, so good evening. She's introduced me, so I'm not going to tell you so much. Um, Sometimes I'm very unconventional, so you wouldn't see me do the typical university stuff. I'll be talking to you and doing stuff. That <laughs> is fine. But I'm talking to you about where discrimination is the norm, not the exception. Quite a strange topic. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm taking another route, typically, of me. We'll look at, shortly, what it means with discrimination, and then we'll go into research a bit. Brain research and social psychology. Look at what it says, and then we'll look at the question, the big question about nature and nurture argument again. It comes in here. We'll look at in-group and out-group um, favoritism, and then I'll approach the main topic of the day. Is discrimination a norm today in our society? I will be using broadly some examples, but mainly looking at Finland. Let's see how many of us are foreigners here by hand. If you're okay, excellent, we have some of us. And do not beat me up if I use your country as an example. Um, I am used to doing that. But how do we define discrimination? Again, I'll go back to research, and this is one of the great guys, social psychologist, um, called Gordon Alport, and let's see how he defined it. Old days, I don't know who here was born then. It refers to inappropriate and potentially unfair treatment of individuals due to group membership, important keyword. Group membership involves denying individuals or group of people equality of treatment, which they may wish. It implies more than just simplifying or distinguishing among people. This is a, another crucial point. We'll come back to it. Is discrimination positive? Is it negative? How do we know? 
When is it positive and when is it negative? And this is interesting. The European Council, very important. So I'll keep back, because we're in Europe, I'll keep going back and forth using some examples with OECD and Europe. Look at their definition. I'm not going to read it. It's a long one. It's similar to what I just read. Why did I highlight this? When I was doing my own research for this, I thought it was very interesting to go to this website to read the definition of discrimination and to see that photo, the picture there. What do you think? I know sometimes imagery doesn't appeal to those of us who are not sensitive to this topic. But for me as a researcher, photos image everything matters. I was struck by this photo. What is wrong with it? Why would you be talking about discrimination and have this kind of photo there? Two men, one white, one black. Where is a woman? Is discrimination towards just black people? What about women? What about kids? These are some of the questions that we approach from the minority research. It's very critical that in talking about that, you don't leave anyone out. Look, they have a long list of people who face this problem in society, and you're using just one aspect of it. And they do not even talk about the fact that they are doing something carefully or cautiously, say that it's because of blah, 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 lack of something, so we are using this photo. They are very blatant. It feels like it's OK. That is why I wanted to highlight it. This is the problem. This is what we are talking. For people in top macro level, they talk about stopping discrimination, but they are the ones perpetuating it, unaware, unconsciously. And that is what brings in this question. Is it a norm today? Now, because of the use of technologies, I have this diagram there to explain a few things. Prejudice and stereotyping, because I'll be interchanging these words, are the real cognitive things that happen in our brain. So you do not discriminate in your brain. You do not, you're not a racist in your brain. What you do is prejudice and you stereotype. The practical manifestation of this brain activity is that you start discriminating. She is a woman, he is a man, I can go out and drink beer with a man and not go out with a woman unless I'm interested in her. This is how the brain functions. So let's be clear on that. And when we discriminate, this is how we see it in life or how people experience it. It's either you're xenophobic, it's either it's racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, religious intolerance, or gender. This is not exhaustive. So if I don't mention something, I'm sorry, but it's, we cannot have everything already. You see that it's long enough. So this is important. Just going forward to know this level, I'll keep going back and forth. So my question is just imagine a world where we could not discriminate between colors, where you couldn't tell if it was red or yellow or green. This might be simplistic, but think about it. What would happen? When you have to go to a party or an important occasion and say, we're all black, it's very formal, and you cannot even distinguish between black and red, and you just go and put on a red and you appear there, how would it function? Imagine your boyfriend or your girlfriend is a twin like I am, and you have to marry, and you go the day and the two guys are standing there, and you cannot discriminate between them. Who would you marry, or which of the girls would you marry? So this is an example to tell us that discrimination is a part of us. This is how the brain works. And in his book, The Nature of Prejudice, Gordon Arbor, the same psychology I, uh, psychologist I talked about, he said, stereotyping, going back to what I explained, and prejudice grew out of normal, not deviant or unusual cognitive processes or activities. This is key. He's making the argument that we as human beings can only thrive by discriminating, classifying, putting things in order so that our brain can function and make sense of our world. So we classify a lot, don't we? And we'll talk about that. For time's sake, I wouldn't be spending time on each one. So prejudice is 
simple an association of sensory cue. So when we say you're prejudiced, what we mean is that, let's say there's a fire or a gunshot here, or a snake just drops here. You, your senses send a message, and then there's a reaction. That is the prejudice part. If a snake should fall here, we we'll all vanish, including myself. And maybe there will be a stampede at the door because everyone wants to save their life. That is prejudice. So in other words, our behaviors and emotions that help us navigate our social sphere are entrenched in networks of neurons within our brains. This is how we function. We need to make these connections and we attach emotion, make sense by classifying and categorizing in our daily routine. This happens at a very fast rate, according to research. So our ability to discriminate plays an important function in understanding the world and how to work and function in this world, if that makes sense. This brings us to a very <laughs> queer position. So is discrimination a good thing at all? Well, it is because kids already know how to discriminate between boys and girls. I have a five-year-old daughter, and when she comes home, I have been very surprised as a researcher to follow her development. How much at five-year-old she already knows that she tells me, Daddy, when we are playing, the boys don't want to be take part in it. And I ask, why do you think so? Well, they don't want to read books with us. They want to go and be running around and climbing things. And I said, don't you do the same? No, we don't do that. The girls don't do that. We sit and talk or play. Five year old, very striking. So it's true, research has proven that kids can discriminate already. Gender roles. And that is how we live. We cannot function without this important um, brain activity. I'm making an argument whether discrimination is part of us or is something that we, we, we learn as we grow. So there is evidence that supports this assertion that, in fact, we learn. Um, discrimination or prejudice is an innate ability. It is part of us. It's something that we automatically have to engage in. It's involuntary, so we can function in this world. Susan Fix is one of them. You can search her up. I wouldn't go so much into her. I'll cite some few examples. But this kind of conclusion, I'm afraid, is very simplistic. Because there's a whole bunch of research that shows that regardless of our innate abilities and purposes, we also learn because we live in a society, and society has an important role in how we think and how we do this. So that brings us to the question of nurture and nature, which is something that we hear a lot in all of them. Now, here's one example of a research that tells us that prejudice or these mental processes are innate. They are part of us, we are born with it, we work with it, and this is how we function. So in their research paper, Chad Phillips and colleagues found research uh, results that support the intractable nature of prejudice in human psyche. Simply what they said was that this is part of us. We discriminate. We, we, we have to put things in classes in order to function as human beings. And they found, interesting, that even self-reported non-prejudiced subjects could be prejudiced in some. So people who think that they are not prejudiced, they don't have any racist or the list that I had, still were found in the laboratory to have a lot of prejudice when they exposed them to some stimuli. For example, they found that white study subjects or the participants had increased amygdala activation while viewing images of black faces when they were listening to violent, misogynistic rap music, but not when listening to death metal or music. Oh, no music, sorry. I don't know if you're following. So when they exposed white participants to music 
rap, American rap. This is done, conducted in the USA. This kind of black, Afro-black rap music that seemed to be harsh towards women. People, like there was the activity going on in the front part of the brain. But if they listen to another music that talked about death and all kinds of things, or nothing at all, there wasn't an activity. And their conclusion was that there's this frontal cortex where they call that, that is where we have all the sensory of empathy and everything going on here in this part. They said it is highlighted when they showed these pictures. And so they made the case that our ability to discriminate is in it. In fact, our mental processes allow that. Here is another argument for the nature. So we've looked at the nature that it is in us. Here we are looking at it's learned. And Tesla and her colleagues also looked at a similar study. They, they used samples and did something similar, quite different. I'll just go to the results. The, resu the results suggest that differential amygdala response to African-American faces does not emerge until adolescence, reflecting the increasing salience of race across development. So they found that until the age of 16, these processes did not matter. There wasn't any significant activity going on. And remember, they looked at kids from four years to 16. They looked at all groups of ages. And that was their conclusion. Another important proof here, and I love this research. A law professor called Osaji Obasoji, you know where he's coming from by now. He interviewed 100 and over blind people because he wanted to understand how they conceptualized racism. You can search, look out for all this research. Very interesting, and I found it very intriguing. And here is what he found. He said, after interviewing all these people, asking them about whether they can recognize race and racism and all this, not only were the blind as aware of race as any sighted person, they also conceive of race visually. You ask a blind person, what is race? And he would say, it's skin color, it's facial features, it's all these visual cues. How do they see this? He said, many respondents trace their perspectives on race to childhood experiences with sighted caretakers who passed along their own attitudes. His conclusion, blind people live in a culture of sighted people. Perception of race is learned. These are compelling results to show that we learn. These things we learn from society, it might be in it, but we also learn a great deal of it from society. Our brains are able to assess, I've mentioned that this happens very fast, who is within the group and who is not within the group. Who is white, who is black, who is brown, who is woman, who is a man? Our brain knows this. In fact, from your, the tone of a voice, people who have not even seen you might know you're a woman or a man. This is how our brain functions. The claim is that this very ability, while it's important for our survival, has largely become a detriment to society. This is my argument. It is positive. Our brain can function by discriminating. We understand that. But today, the reality is that this same brain function is causing a lot of problems for society. And Alpo again argues that the in-group favoritism plays a fundamental role in intergroup relations. And we are all, we are all aware of that. We, we belong to cliques. We work very well. Even classmates hang out together more than they do with the other group. This is very common. We know that. And that is the problem. I'll share one interesting result with you, and then we'll move on to the question for the day. In another study by Henry, he showed teenagers paintings of two famous singers and asked them which 
of these artists they preferred. After they had selected or decided, he then gave them money and said, would you, how would you, who would you spend this money with? Or who would you give money to? And the finding is striking again. People that did not know each other before, a minute ago, these are subjects that were brought into a laboratory, did not know each other before, but in the laboratory, they only could associate with people that liked the same musician. And we all know this, when you go to a concert, it might be your first time you meet somebody there. When the music starts, you start dancing and you don't care who you're dancing with. It's just because you all love the same musician. So that was an important finding and that confirms the idea that we tend to affiliate more with in-group. What is the argument I'm making? This system of in-group, out-group is what leads to systematic and structural discrimination. Just imagine at the macro level, at the state level, at the nation level, this kind of thing. I know some of you don't even pay attention. I'm traveling tomorrow. I'm going to Athens. Each time I travel, I'm saddened by these signs. EU nationals, all other passports, and go and see the queue. And the processes you have to go through if you're a non-EU. But look at it carefully. This is a clear demarcation. You belong here, you don't belong. You are the other. We are us. But look further. There's another layer of discrimination going on there. Do you see? I think I have a pointer. I should point to something. Fast track. Passport, e-passport gate. You know, I know, when you go to the, you don't, these things, you don't even pay attention to them. This is part of how society have trained you that everything is normal. So for you, it's a normal thing that people are discriminated against. It's okay, this is life you go on. People like me pay attention to everything. Another layer of discrimination, even for the whites, for the EUs, there's another layer of discrimination. If you read under the fast track, it said by invitation only. I can, you, when I send the PowerPoint, you see here. So it's not that everyone can go that route. If you want to get out fast, you just, no. Only by invitation. There's the other guys that can use electronic. Not everyone has electronic. I'm making a case that we live in a society where discrimination has become a norm. We are even oblivious to it because we've been socialized to see it as normal. So I come back to the question, is discrimination the norm, not the exception in society today? And my answer is yes, I'll be happy to hear yours later on, what you think. And here is why. First, I'll show you data from the OECD. I'm an educationist, so I can't give you any example. First, I must talk about education. Look at the results. Let me just briefly walk you through. Here, second generation immigrant, first generation, why? Look at them, why? We are talking about academic underachievement. And look at that. Over 50%, first generation, a little below 40%, second generation. This, the documents are there. You can all add, retrieve it. Go to OECD. I think OECD and EU has some of the best research done. If they will consult me, I'll tell them they should start granting researchers money to do research. They should put money into dissemination. We, have, we know a lot. There's all the information we need there. Research has been done. The problem is that people don't even know they exist. That is the problem we have today. Look at students, first generation, second generation, they are failing, they are not making it. Data supports it, we know this. President, prime ministers know this. Members of parliament know this. They are aware, they know, they read. Why aren't they changing anything? Why do we keep the status quo? Why is it okay? And we sit back and blame them. Is their daddy's fault? Is their family fault? Well, I tell people it's very simple. If you think it's the fault of parents, then I'm a deviant. I'm an immigrant. 
I'm an African, I was born in Ghana. My parents were not wealthy. I came here, I've gone through all the challenges that any immigrant, African immigrant, goes through. Here I am, an assistant professor. How come, how can it be true that we can make it? It's all about the opportunity. It's not a question of my background where I was born and people who know this know this, that once you educate anyone, they have the potential to make it. Sometimes I don't want to deviate. Otherwise, I would have given you a series of examples where and why I think it is very intentional today. Why we deliberately allow this to happen. And then people talk about it and make a lot of case out of it. When we know and we can solve it, it's very easy. And they know it. Why would they let it happen? And blame society and blame immigrants again for dropping out of school. I want you to look at other things here. This is just a performance. Weak sense of belonging to school. Low satisfaction with life. High school work related anxiety, poor achievement motivation. If you look at sense of belonging, again, first generation and second generation immigrant are the ones that suffer most. They don't feel like they belong. And because I didn't have data, I didn't know what I would have shown you country specific data in Finland, and the clear data, what the data tells us about countries. It's worrying. This is clear di discrimination. And then I hear people tell me, especially my colleagues in teacher education, and they know I'm really, really, really tough on this. All I hear is keep blaming immigrant parents. No one ever sit down and think about the system, the structure. That is discrimination in itself. It's a challenge, it's a problem. We have to rethink how we. Why, is, why do I think that discrimination is an arm? And you can read this. A certain president can decide to call Mexican rapists, thieves, can decide to call the whole, a whole continent shithole use misogynistic language against women, say anything, and the whole world sits silent. I've not seen a single president of another country say that, Mr. President, this is immoral. This is discriminatory. This is not okay. Why are we sitting down? Why do we let the bad people rule? It is a discriminated world. We know it. But to that level, it's unacceptable. And I've been very surprised and shocked I question my American colleagues all the time when I have the opportunity. I say, why are you all the brilliant guys? I grew up knowing that most of the brilliant guys we have in the world and have died and lived today are all from the US. What are they doing? Why can't one person stand up and say, we know these historians who know the history. Why can they challenge him? It's because discrimination is normal. And we felt it should be normal. That is the problem. When women cannot get equal pay for the same job, are we talking about equality? Where? Equality for what? Look at all, go look at policy document. And what we say about anti-discrimination, anti-equality laws. What is happening in reality? We all know this. That is discrimination. A few other things. I cannot have all the time to show you. This is not a class, so we can talk. But here are a few examples for you to think about. People out of the group, I intentionally call them so. They can criticize the Finnish government and talk about how they fear its policies and behavior without being seen as a cultural outsider. I have been attacked a lot, even when one of my um, work was published Someone from Uleg just called me and interviewed me. And I happily gave an interview, a very positive one about Finland. Yet, another colleague in another university, I wouldn't tell you. In fact, I understood what bullying is at that point. A very nice thing I did, and the kind of emails that I got from Finns, I was overwhelmed. I was surprised. 
One interview, granted, and people are talking me, uh, attacking me for having a voice and being clear. This is my research. This is what happens. People can't even talk. They don't have the right to talk about society. Even in research, if I publish a data that is critical of Finland, I have my own colleague researchers coming to me, Imano, you know, this is not how it is. I think there's some problem with your data. The kind of research, and I'm like, okay. So you cannot even accept the fact that there's something wrong with your society and the system. Discrimination has been normalized. It's okay. And you don't even know it. You're not aware, even as brilliant scholars. That is a huge surprise to me. People can choose where they want to live. Maybe that is not obvious because you can just get up and move anytime you want. But I challenge you to go out there and ask. The stress people have to go through to even change flats. This is discrimination. No one cares. You can be sure if you get legal help, not even medicine. This is a safeguard. You just get up, you go anywhere, and it is there for you. It is not the same for many others. This is discrimination. It's been normalized. It's OK. Nobody even cares. No, who knows? People don't know that this is happening. You are not pressured to use Swedish or Finnish here. It's normal. I have to write a Swedish or a Finnish exam because before I become a citizen. That is putting pressure. That is discrimination. That is not normal. And I have people challenge me on what basis can you say that is discrimination. We go back to what I defined. Do I pay taxes? Yes. Have I lived here long? Yes. Do I have a family here? Yes. I have a lot of argument. But the system will tell you by law, this is how you become one of us. I have to conform. Should it be that way? No. This is normalized. No one even think about it. And people will question you for raising your voice before, because they think it's normal. My question is, what is all this anti-discrimination law there for? You can read the EU level, OECD, America, whatever, Finnish. This is the Finnish law. You should go and research how many laws, anti-discrimination and equality laws there are in your country. You'll be surprised how many there are. What are we doing? How do we know they are even in effect? Don't discriminate, don't discriminate. This is just a snapshot. Go and look a long paper. Each time I travel, I'm discriminated. That is the fact. Who can you report to? My argument is that discrimination has been normalized. We've been socialized to thinking that it's, it's how life should be, but we don't even spot it. We don't know it. We don't see it when we see one. I will end soon. And again, an important thing. You're telling me you're writing about anti-discrimination laws, and then you highlight boldly their translation from Finnish, legally binding only in Finnish and Swedish, Minister of Justice, Finland. Is that discriminatory or not? I challenge us to start looking at what discrimination is. This is very discriminatory. It's only binding in Swedish and Finnish, not in English. If I go to court, it means that I should have the Swedish translation or the Finnish. Otherwise, the judges can throw my case out because of this phrase. Is it discriminatory? Yes. Think about the investment in which we are. Every day I receive emails. In what language? Swedish. And they talk about internationalization. If we talk about internationalization, we should make sure that the people that we call international can fit in. They can understand what is happening. Bringing an international and forcing them when they arrive to be like you is discriminatory. It's assimilation. It's not OK. My argument is that we live in a society today where discrimination has become so normalized that we do not support it. I'll briefly touch on the impact. It's been shown a wealth of psychological research shows that discrimination can exhibit stress. It causes stress. Stress leads to a lot of health issues, such as anxiety, depression, and even disappearing in children. It also has physiological, really physical 
harm on the individual. People that have gone through discrimination will tell you they suffer heartbeat, impulses, upset. They get really angry for days. Some don't even sleep over many nights because of that experience. There are others, but I can't touch on them. I think this is where I end. This was a brief overview that we are living at a time when it becomes so normal that we hardly see it, but it's happening. I invite you to open your eyes, be interested in it, and do your small part to stamp out discrimination. Thank you. I will just hold the microphone for those who have questions. I have a question. <laughs> Go ahead. So, first of all, thank you, and thank you for all that information that you gave to us, and it's a lot of, you know, to just observe and a lot to yeah. think about. Um, You've been saying that discrimination is kind of like wired in our brains mm -hmm. and is kind of like embedded in our social and institutional structures. Um, have you had a thought about uh, any practical solutions each of us can do every day to decrease discrimination? Thank you Thank very you. much. Very good question. So how do we deal with it? What do we do to, to, to stop it in society? Well, we did not have time, but research again shows that it can be unlearned. So that's the good news. We can unlearn it because it's learned. We can unlearn discrimination. One or two tips. It, research has shown that kids that are exposed to diversity, for example, if you're born in Finland, they go to a nursery, a daycare, or a primary school that has immigrants there, grew up on learning this. It's very important that they're exposed to diversity. They travel and they meet different people. Remember in the blind research with the blind people, it's the language of parent, caretakers that matter. One other way is for parents to approach the question head on. Talk about it. And when I talk about this in Obo, I had a colleague walk up to me and say, Emmanuel, I'm sorry because I've been perpetuating this. And he gave me a clear example, just to answer your question, why parents are inactive in handling this question. He said, my little boy, we were driving, he saw a black man passing, and he said a derogatory word. I was confused as a dad. I did not say anything because I thought that way he would forget. He wouldn't continue this kind of language. But today, Emmanuel, you told me that that was wrong. And I said, yes. Being passive is just like bullying. Being passive, standing there when bullying is happening, and you don't say anything, you say, by walking away, I'm not participating. It's a lie. You're complicit. You're more dangerous than the one perpetrating the bullying. By walking away, and this research has proven. So for parents, it's important that we tackle this. When your kids start talking about this, Make it clear, talk more about it. If you don't have the expertise, make sure you can get someone who knows a bit more to talk about it. So just two tips, there's more. You can talk to me later. It's important that we talk about it and not just let it go. This is how we can unlearn it, by shying away, and especially in the Finnish culture, where people don't talk so much. They shy away from confronting very challenging topic. It's important that we become aware that we cannot shy away from talking about this. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for your uh, presentation. I have a question regarding um, discrimination at the state level. Uh, when exactly do we know that the state is being discriminative and when do we know that uh, uh, the state is just uh, fixing its own rules and it's legitimate to draw lines and be selective in terms of the legal uh, legislation and everything? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Very important question, but also a tricky one. We are not by any way challenging the right of a nation to put in place laws that protect their citizens and the right to say that this belongs to us and not to everyone. But two key things. Think about it. I wouldn't give an exact answer in order not to increment myself. I have my personal answers and impression about it. I can also tell you. But two things. Why would people believe that within the EU, it's okay that people can cross borders without any fear? 
when a person from Africa cannot come, when actually biologists have shown there was a recent publication by German scientists debunking racism, saying that there's nothing to fear. So come back to the question of in-group, out-group. People make this up. The laws are made to protect something we know do not even exist. Most people tell you fear is just something that is invented. It doesn't exist. It actually has nothing. The things that we fear about don't actually exist. So most of the laws are made based on what we go back to research and other things tell us. But actually, they make life more challenging than. So I feel personally that states have the right, but in making the rules, for example, I gave you an example of why language, the Finnish or Swedish language, is an important part of becoming a Finn. And I think it's an infringement on, at the same time on the right of foreigners who live here and pay taxes, especially if they've lived here long, do not have any other criminal record, and have even married. These people have the right to claim to be living here because they don't have anywhere to go. In other countries, their, their laws are different. So ask me, why is the US having a different law, very flexible one? Why is the UK having a law, very flexible? It's not all about the English language. It's about other means of showing that you are a good citizen and you are participating and contributing to the economy. Why would Finland restrict it to that? So then it become a legal question. They have the right, but people have a case. But the other people, their case is trumped upon because of national laws, and that's not okay. And we know this, and the legal group guys know it. But they wouldn't do anything because, again, this is Finland. We live with what we feel. No one can question it. And that, again, is a problem. It's discrimination. So it goes and goes up. But it's always the powerful that has the power. The weak would never win any case. The lawyer that will be sitting on it is a powerful person, has links, in-group, would favor the in-group. So you get my point. It's a failed battle. Yes. That, thanks for your question. Thank you, um, Professor. Um, it's like a question and a comment. Is that, have you experienced or done any research on hierarchical racism or segregative racism? Thank you for your question. It's not up until now, it's not something I've researched, but I know it exists. For example, let me give you a clear, simple one, no textbook understanding. If you are black and you come from the US, you are treated differently even in Finland than a black coming from West Africa or any other African country. This is clearly talking about what you're talking about. That is a problem. It's again hierarchy. It's just the mindset that everything US is big, it's important. They are not typically the black that we know who come from, to use somebody's word, shithole, Sorry for that, but these are coming from a better society, so they don't bring problems to us. Are you getting the point? So that is, is that it's happened. We know there's research. I've personally not done research about it, but it exists and it happened and it affects people. So if you look at the EU and the OECD new research on racism, you know where Finland belongs, right? Very problematic. And the most of the respondent that Race question about racism are all coming from West Africa and African countries, not any other part. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Emmanuel. Uh, and I think we can go for a break. <laughs>